We've squeezed a little extra in to kind of shorten the series, but it still get the content in, and uh, you'll find out why that's important. Each night will build on the night before. It is really critical as we study the Bible that we start at a beginning point and then are able to continue on in the presentations. And I'll talk about tomorrow night's presentation as we conclude tonight so you'll have some idea what it is that we'll be talking about. Uh, I'm sure that, how many of you got one of these in the mail, these brochures in the mail? Okay, great. Uh, You might want to take one, I encourage you to take one as you leave tonight or the one that you might still have at home and invite a friend or or a family member or an enemy. Just make sure if it's an enemy, it's a nice enemy, all right? And uh, you can take one and give it to them. We have a few extras out in the lobby. There's uh, a few there. And if we run out of the big ones, we have some little ones that look like this. They'll accomplish the same thing. And you can, uh, uh, it doesn't have the schedule on it, but you can tell them what the schedule is if you're inviting them. Or they can go to the website and they can find that as well. So as you leave tonight, we encourage you to grab one of those and to take them with you as well. We handed out some blank cards, and those cards are there for you to be able to put questions on. I'm sure that many of you along the way will have some questions. And the easiest way, rather than we trying to take the time to answer those questions from the floor, which just makes it more challenging to stay on schedule, you can write your question down, and you can turn the question in as you leave. There's a question box out there for you to be able to put your question in, and if you will do that, it would be great. It would be helpful if you put your name on it, just in case we get so many questions that we can't get to every question. I can come to you individually, perhaps, and be able to help you. You, you know, maybe we can get acquainted here, and I can figure out who you are, and we can figure out how to answer your questions. So if you put your name on it, great. If you don't, we'll still work at answering your question. No problem with that, and glad to be able to help you. Also, the quiz that Lou mentioned to you, again, that is so that you can take some notes. It'll keep you also focused on what we're going to be talking about. And so it's just a tool for you to use. Do not fear. I'm not that kind of a teacher, and I'm not taking this back home with me and and grading you, whatever. It's just for you, and as Lou said, for your enjoyment and to help you in in your study process as well. I do want you to know that the Bible is our textbook, all right? So if you don't have a Bible, we have a Bible that you can use, and we'd be happy to uh, provide that for you. That tool is there. We also, if you registered ahead of time, you should have gotten the Kingdoms in Time DVD. How many of you got the Kingdoms in Time DVD? I mean, that's a fantastic tool. I was looking at it a little bit more uh, this afternoon, and it's a wonderful thing. I know that you will enjoy it and you will appreciate it. We'll have some other gifts along the way to give to you, so we encourage you to come here and, and uh, participate, and we'll have some things to give you, and a special gift, especially at the end, that will be available to those who will come every single night. We want to give that to you as a special uh, a gift there. We'll, if, there are, if everybody comes, we may have to have a drawing for that at the end, but we'll tell you more about that along the way, just to keep you thinking about what we're going to be doing. Tonight, Jesus unfolds prophecy for today. Now, there are two screens here. I'm going to look at one or the other. I'll try to keep going one direction so you can figure it out, but you can... uh, I know that sometimes when I look there, people tend to look there as well, and we'll try to uh, keep that. I'm right-handed, so chances are I'm going to look that direction, and if I point, I'll probably point in that direction as well. I want you to know that Jesus on Prophecy is dedicated to making known the importance of taking heed to the prophetic words of the Bible. What a lot of people don't realize is that Jesus is the source of prophecy. That's why we've titled this series, Jesus on Prophecy. He's the one who brings prophecy to us. And as we will see here in just a few moments, very directly in the book of Revelation, we will see Jesus speaking about what He wants us to know and why prophecy is important. 
but the Bible's prophecies especially look at one most important event, that is the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. It is so filled in the New Testament and the Old Testament, I might add. The event is the return of Jesus Christ to this world, and He wants people of planet earth to be ready for His coming. So we're going to be talking about that tonight and see why the time in which you and I live is so important to us to understand what prophecy is about. We also want to learn that it's not just knowing about Jesus, it's also learning to walk with Him because Jesus doesn't want us simply to have information, He wants to also affect our lives. So we want to encourage you to be here each night as we build on the studies together. And the Bible is going to be, again, our textbook, and you will have the ability to see how the Bible can change your life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And this series is dedicated to revealing Him to you and to me. I'd like to start, though, with a word of prayer because Jesus is our source of truth, and we want Him to guide, uh, guide us through His Holy Spirit. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we want to thank You for the Bible. We want to thank You also for Jesus, and we want to thank You for the promise to guide us through Your Holy Spirit. And we want to ask You especially to be with us as we go through some of the prophecies in the Bible tonight. We pray that you will reveal to us what we need to know to encourage us in a world that is, it seems to be so mixed up and confused. I pray that you will teach us, and we thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Our topic tonight, Jesus Unfolds Prophecy. What prophecy? Prophecy for today. As we go through our study, we're going to be reminded that we live in a, an awful world. As a matter of fact, the condition of the world today is a fulfillment of prophecy. It's no secret that our world is in chaos. It is an ever-changing place with pain and suffering and evil that seems to be even more dramatically evil as each day unfolds. I don't know if you are like me, but I look at the news from time to time, and as I look at the news, I'm saying, can it get any worse than it is today? And then I find out that, yes, tomorrow it does indeed get worse than it was the day before. It seems to be escalating. Natural disasters continue to increase. Daily, there seems to be fresh news about an earthquake, a tsunami, a hurricane, or some other misfortune that comes upon people. Last week, did you notice it was reported that something happened that has never happened before? Did you hear me? Never happened before. Six tropical storms at one time. They said it broke all the records. Never happened before. Financial corruption, poverty, and the uncertainty that we have in this world today seems as though the future is just too scary to worry about. It seems to be overwhelming and drives many people to depression at rates literally unprecedented in human history. With the constant threat of terrorism, of violence, political unrest, social injustice. There's so much tension in the world, it seems like it can't get much more difficult than that. And it seems as though these things are beyond human ability and human intelligence to be able to solve. I'd like to suggest that's exactly right. It is. Many people are broken today and are looking for answers. Perhaps you are one of those individuals. 
They need and want help. We want help and we want hope. We're desiring something better, but we're unsure where to look. Millions are asking, what is coming next? What can we expect for the future? What does it hold? Others are wondering, where is God in all of this? Is God out there? Does He care about us? Why, if He cares about us, do these things continue to happen? We're actually going to answer that question in part tonight and also in the coming nights. We're going to see the incredible plan that God has for our world and you personally as we dig into more deeply the Word of God, and I'd like to start that process right now. The Bible is not an ordinary book. It has foretold world history for thousands of years, and in advance, I might add, with such perfect accuracy that when we get done studying these prophecies, you will understand that the Bible is a book that can be trusted. You may have come to this series not knowing what to expect from the series, but you will experience God speaking to your heart as you study His Word. And tomorrow night, I believe when we look at the prophecy we're going to look at tomorrow evening, you will say, that's amazing, that's incredible. How could that even be? It could be because God provides prophecy so that you and I will know what to expect from the future and also how to live in the present. Bible prophecy gives us clear insight into where the, our world is headed in the future. This, uh, there is a book in the Bible that I want to begin with this evening that is specifically geared towards speaking to humanity in these last days, and it reveals Christ in a remarkable way. It reveals the very character of God. It reveals the heart of Christ. It reveals His plans for both this world and your life. That book is the book of Revelation. It is the book that some people actually believe we should be afraid of. We should be avoiding at all costs. And yet it is a book that specifically is given to reveal more to us about Jesus, first of all, and secondly, about what to expect in the last days of this world. The book of Revelation is written by a man named John. John was one of Jesus' closest disciples. And John, when he wrote this book, he had spent th uh, three years with Jesus, three and a half years with Jesus, and many years serving Him in presenting the gospel message to the world. He was present when Jesus was crucified. He was present uh, with Jesus for those three and a half years that I mentioned. And when he starts the book... Look what he says. Now, I'm going to be putting text up on the screen. We will give you a copy of the basic content of tonight's lesson. When you leave tonight, it'll have the Bible verses, but you can write them down. They're also there on the quiz there for you to be able to keep uh, track of them as well. But we're going to put a text up on the screen from time to time. I encourage you to open your Bible. There are two main books we're going to look at today. The first one is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. So it's easy to find if you're not familiar with how to get around in the Bible. So if you go to the very end of the book, you'll, of the Bible, you'll find the book of Revelation. Um, and by the way, I need to mention this about prophecy. The purpose of prophecy is for us to be able to do this. And here's our first verse. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 says, The revelation of whom? Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Things which must shortly, sorry, wrong button, which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. What's the purpose of the book of Revelation? It is for us to be able to see more of Jesus Christ. He wants us to know also 
what things are going to take place in the future. And then he says this, Cursed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. Is that what it says? You need to double check me. By the way, you can't trust a human being, but you can trust the Bible. So make sure you are keeping me on my toes and that I'm quoting the Bible verses the way they're written. John said, blessed is he who reads those who hear the, uh, and who, those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So the purpose of prophecy has threefold purpose. Number one, God wants to reveal Christ to us in a deeper way. Christ is the center of prophecy. Without Jesus as the center, we will only have information. I mentioned that earlier. But with Christ at the center, He will bring information into our lives that will lead to transformation in our lives. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which means that it should show us something about Jesus. Does that make sense? So you've thought about Revelation just as being a book that predicts certain things to happen. Yes, it does. But at the center of those things are, is Jesus Christ. The second thing that it reveals to us is that He wants us to be blessed by what we learn. So if you've been afraid of the book of Revelation, you can relax because it's not there to hurt you, to scare you, but it is there to encourage you. It is there to bless you. Our hearts are to be open to receive the message that He has for us. In this seminar, you may learn many new things, but you will see that they are coming from the Word of God. The Bible is our textbook, as I said earlier. And when you know it comes from the Bible, you know it comes from Jesus Himself. Also, the Bible is, the book of Revelation is there because it is there to help us to understand what will take place in the future. God does not want us to be in the dark about the future of the world. The world is filled with fear today. People wander through life wondering what to expect. And many people, most people, don't really know because they haven't been students of the Bible. But God wants us to understand that Bible prophecy speaks directly to our time today. I think you will see that very clearly tonight. He wants us to understand what is happening in our time. Make no mistake, prophecy is being fulfilled today in 2019. As you study through Bible prophecy, you will find many scenes, including ones like the one you see on the screen this evening. When you get to the second half of the book of Revelation, you will find God revealing beasts and other powers there as well. Many people, though, become confused as they look at these symbols of Bible prophecy because they don't realize that the Bible actually tells us what the prophecy symbols mean. And as we go through this night after night, you and I will be able to understand what they mean. It will be very clear. It's not confusing. The wonderful thing is the Bible tells us. Also in Revelation, there is a message for our time. It's found in Revelation chapter 14. It's a powerful message that goes across the entire earth, the Bible tells us. And we're going to study a little bit about it this evening, just to introduce it, and we will look at it more in depth in nights in the future. It's a message, though, that the whole world needs to hear. It is a message that is directed to God's people, the people on this earth at the end of time. It is the last plea of God for humanity. We will also find that it, this message is critical for us in being able to understand the mark of the beast, to understand who the beast is, 
and to understand about earth's final crisis. In Revelation 14, verses, uh, verse 6, this is what it says. Revelation 14, verse 6. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying in the next verse, verse 7, with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. As you look at this picture in Revelation chapter 14, you begin to understand that Jesus is trying to communicate to you and to me in these last days. He wants us to understand He has something important for us to hear. The most important elements of this message are that we should recognize what God is saying to us in these last days. Notice that it identifies the fact that he wants us to know the hour of his judgment and that it has come already. In future nights, we'll look at it more closely and we'll see that the judgment has already begun. The Bible says that in Revelation. We'll look at it more closely. We also see that this declaration of the judgment begins, though, with a message of hope, not of fear, but something that should encourage us. It should let us know that He cares about us. Because as we looked at Revelation 14, verse 6, it says that part of the message is the everlasting gospel. The word gospel is a Greek word that simply means good news, not bad news. So God says that He has a message for the world, and it is really good news. God cares about us. He wants us to know that His message of judgment is mingled with love and great mercy. God cares about us enough to tell us what we need to know for the future. As we look around, even non-religious people sense that something strange is going on in the world. They sense that things are not going the way uh, God would want them to. There seem to be unsolvable problems, but God has a solution to those problems. Going on in Revelation chapter 14, now just an introduction to these various segments. I want you to notice that as we get a little further in Revelation, the messages that God is giving, that Jesus is giving, center especially on a people getting ready to meet Jesus when He comes. And He said, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God promises that He will have a people that are ready to meet Him when He comes, and He describes them in this passage. Tonight, you will have not only an opportunity to learn about these basic truths, but you'll also realize that as you learn more about Jesus, He wants us to respond to Him. He cares about us so much, He wants to be our friend. He's not somebody to be afraid of. He's the person who cares enough about us to tell us what's coming on this world and that He wants to be part of our lives to help us to be ready. There is nothing that God cannot do in your life to change your situation into one where you can learn to trust Him. He may not be able to take your problem away, but He can teach you how to live with the problem or the challenges that you might have. When we study this message of the three angels that we were just looking at in future nights, you won't want to miss that study. This mess, these messages begin to move into the message reminding us that Jesus is coming again. The verse that's on the screen says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. The Son of Man is Jesus, having on His head a golden crown, and is in His hand a sharp sickle. Jesus will return to this earth. If you go away with nothing else tonight, go away with the assurance that Jesus is coming again, and that He will come back for you and for me. In verse 15, John records the messages again. 
And he says, another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. As he continues on, he says, so he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. This is a picture of Jesus coming again. When he comes back, he's coming to take all those that have accepted Him and are following Him and want to live with Him. He's promised He's going to take suffering and sin and sadness, that they will be no more. It's a glorious day He's promised. I don't know about you. How many of you would like to see sin and suffering gone? I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of it. Tonight, we want to be ready when Jesus comes. Later in the book of Revelation, you will find out about something that you may have read or heard about, and that is the battle of Armageddon and the seven last plagues. In Revelation chapter 17, there's also a last global power called Babylon, a system of religious confusion that will strive to deceive the entire world at the end of time. We will learn exactly what God's plan is, and how He wants us to know who the power is and how we can be, avoid being deceived. We need to realize that deception is at the focus of what God is trying to help us to avoid. He wants us not to be deceived. As we walk with Christ and follow Him in His Word, His love and truth will guide us in every aspect of our lives and help us to avoid the lies that the devil tries to bring to us. We don't need to fear, for Jesus is the one who was resurrected. And in Revelation chapter 19, there's a beautiful picture of Jesus coming in again. The artist made this representation of what it says in Revelation chapter 19, but it's a picture of the second coming of Jesus, the King of Kings, and it reminds us that the time is at hand and that we are about to experience this climactic event, and we will look at it more in the future studies. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, the Jesus that tells us about these prophetic events wants us to understand something very critical to the book of Revelation. He simply says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. The book of Revelation is not just a book about the future. It is a book about the present. And your life and mine, the present life in which you and I live, is one that Jesus says, I have promises that I can help you live your life and it can be the fullest life that you can uh, desire. That is what He wants to do for us. He wants to take the burdens away from us. And then He says in verse 21 of the same chapter, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as also I overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. There's tremendous power in the life of Jesus that He wants to share with you and to give to you and to me. And He, in book of Revelation, this is what He encourages us with. Why would I want to be afraid of a book that says that He wants to help me? He says He can help us to be overcomers, victorious in the life that will bring joy and peace. We can be overcomers as He was. You may be an individual who's struggling with issues in your life. You've certainly met people who are suffering from terrible diseases, some who aren't going to survive, but they can have hope and they can know that there's a better day coming because Jesus is the source of our help. The inescapable conclusion that we can come to tonight is that there will be a generation of people living on the earth who will see Jesus when He comes. And the amazing thing is that their lives will be so surrendered to Him that they will be like Him in character. They will be pure. They, their lives will have been changed by Him. Tonight, I want you to know that as we go through these prophecies, that we will be able to see Jesus revealed more plainly. And... His love for us 
will be even more clear and plain. Could it be that the last great events to come upon earth are just before us? A promise before I share with you a prophecy from Jesus Himself. The promise is this in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may, you may be also. That's an incredible promise. Jesus said when He left this earth that He was going to prepare a place for us. I want to be there. How about you? I want to be there. I want to, I, if He's pre- preparing the place for me, He said it right there. He's preparing a place for me. Put your name there. He's preparing it for you. I want to be there. And He wants us to know that it's not that far in the future. There's no darkness in that world He's going to take us to, but there's plenty in this world today. There's no disease in the world He's taking to us to, no struggle in the place He's taking to. He wants us to be there with Him, and He wants us to be able to experience His love in a very special way. In the Bible, there are signs that clearly indicate that Jesus is about to come, and we're going to learn just about those right now. In the book of Matthew, and that's the second book that we're going to especially look at tonight. You have a Bible near you, pick it up and look at it. You might want to just follow along. I'll have them up on the screen as well. But you'll see what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24. I don't have time to go through the whole chapter. It's like a mini book of Revelation in, uh, in the book of Matthew. But this is Jesus speaking. And he starts out by saying, and and, uh, Matthew records this, that he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? How would you like to have a private audience with Jesus and be able to say, when are these things going to happen? You know when they're going to happen. Tell me, when are they going to happen? Now, he's not going to tell you that it's going to happen on April 25 in 2020. He's not going to tell you that. But Jesus does have an answer, and He gave one to His disciples. He sat there with the disciples, and He gave them some instruction, and it's pretty dramatic. I want you to see it tonight. In verse 3, again, He says, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They asked Him point blank, blank, said, what Jesus are the signs of your coming. How will we know? Jesus said, you will see the signs and you will know that His coming is near. And what will be the signs? That's what we want to look at right now. In verse 4, Jesus said said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. That's a warning, folks. I don't know if you realize it, But there's a lot of deception out there today. You and I only have one source of help and truth. That is the Bible. You and I cannot afford to be confused. You need to test everything you are told and taught by the Bible. And that includes what I say to you tonight and in the nights ahead. Open your Bible. Read it. Go back, even if we go quickly through Bible verses here, go back home and read them again and make sure that I didn't tell you something that is not according to the Bible. So that's why I'm telling you, open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24 as we look at a few of these things this evening. Matthew 24, Jesus warns us, don't be deceived. Notice that in Revelation, it also mentioned Watch out for being deceived. You and I need to realize that today. In chapter 24 of Matthew, he continues by saying, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Did you know that there are thousands in the world who claim to be Jesus himself? 
Did you know that in the United States alone, there are about 1,200 people who claim to be Jesus? Yep. And you know the scary part? They have all kinds of followers. Sometimes there are a few, sometimes there are hundreds, and even thousands, maybe even millions. We'll talk about that another time. Paul said in 1 Timothy, in chapter 4, verses 1 to 1 and 2, he said, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That's what the world is like today. But many, it says, will depart from the faith. That's why you and I must be students of the Bible. You can't believe what somebody tells you unless it agrees with the Bible. You need You and I need to be studying the Bible. Today, the occult, witchcraft, and sorcery are extremely possible and widely accepted. It's often portrayed as innocent fun and and programs on TV, zombies and vampires and other things that have become obsessions in television, movies, books, games, and even more. But the Bible has something to warn us about. The Scriptures are coming to life because... Jesus said, and the Bible writers warned us, that these things can deceive us. No deception simply comes as a deception. A false prophet doesn't come up to you and say, I'm a false prophet, by the way, right? The false prophets usually claim to be true prophets, which is why Jesus wanted to warn you that you need to be careful. It is not enough to simply believe Jesus in name only. You and I need to allow the Bible to teach us. Here are some of the signs that Jesus spoke of. In verse 6, he said, You will hear war of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Going on in verse 6, he says a little bit more to us about this as well. But you know what? Have you heard of any rumors of wars lately? Does it seem like it's like every day? World War II, 24 million people died. World War I, I'm sorry, 24 million people died. World War II, 70 million people died. Just try to imagine how massive that number is. Jesus wanted to under, us to understand what it was going to be like just before he came back. More than 280 million people died from war in the 20th century. 280 million people. More than all of all the other centuries combined, people died because of war in the 20th century. Today, there are nearly 10 million people living in Michigan. So in the last century, what does that mean? It means that 28 times the number of people in the state of Michigan died in war in one century, the last one. The constant threat of global calamity is not something that was on the docket before 1900. But after 1900, as the wars began to expand and man seemed to get smarter about how to kill people, Jesus' prophecies were being fulfilled. In Revelation 11, verse 18, this is what John said there. The nations are, were angry and that you should reward your servants and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Surely we are living in those times. We are living in a time when what Jesus said about the earth is being fulfilled. A sign of His coming and the end of the world are the wars and the rumors of wars. There's no question that we... He was speaking of our own time today. But remember, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. That's the promise we want to keep in mind. In verse 7, he goes on. He says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Let's look at a few statistics here just to keep this in perspective. The United Nation tells us that one in nine people don't get enough food to live a healthy life. We can forget about our own place of comfort very easily without realizing that the rest of the world suffers greatly. It's a huge problem. One person in 
uh, dies every five seconds from hunger-related causes, in spite of the fact that one-third of the food produced on our planet is wasted. Nine hundred and twenty-five million people are malnourished or hungry. We are in a difficult time. But the Bible said it would be like that. Many people say, if God is all-powerful, why does He go on allowing these things to happen? Why do these things seem to be increasing? For some reason, people say, well, if that's the case, then God must not exist. No, God exists. He existed, exists, and He told us how these things would be just before He comes back. We do forget, though, that there is a devil, and he is the one who causes these problems. I don't know about you, but I've had enough, and these problems are there not because God is causing them, but because there is plenty of food, but too much greed, too much selfishness, and too much carelessness with what we have. Something to talk about later, but in a world that's so advanced, so intelligent, so studied, so qualified, so technically advanced, how is it that the population of this world is starving to death physically from hunger-related causes? Americans waste 220 pounds of food a year. Now, that's not all of America. That's just me and then you waste 220 pounds, and then everybody else wastes that amount of food. It must break the heart of God. What are pestilences? No, we're not talking about ants in your house. We're talking about disease, strains of disease resistant to antibiotics, new diseases without a cure. There's been an explosion of these in the last 100 years. AIDS may have been around, uh, you may have seen that and known about it all your life, but is less than 100 years old, and today it's killing 2 million people a year. We can thank God for the advancements of medications and treatments and that HIV is no longer considered to be a uh, death sentence, but truth is many people are still dying because they don't have access to those medications. And to add to that issue of AIDS, all over the world, people are dying from heart disease, from cancer, from diabetes. There are 80 million pre-diabetics in the United States. It's costing the nation billions and billions of dollars. And on top of that, people are dying from heart attacks and uh, cancer. And these are modern-day pestilences that we have yet to overcome. We don't think about them so much, but there are other diseases that pop up every once in a while. They scare us just by the thought of them. Oh, it's nice to know they're in Africa, Ebola or SARS or mad cow disease, but when they, we start thinking of them coming to the United States, it terrifies us. It's a sign of the last days, reminding us of the days in which you and I live. In fact, when you and I really think about it throughout the history of humanity, we have, for the most part, had the same diseases. Measles, mumps, smallpox, typhoid fever. And yet, have you noticed how they're coming back again? The words of Jesus from 2,000 years ago are true. We wonder about earthquakes. Are they really um, increasing? How about 220 2,000 people who died from an earthquake in Haiti a few years ago. My wife and I have an adopted son from Haiti. We got acquainted with him after the earthquake. He came to the United States one week before the earthquake hit, and he said if he hadn't gotten out, he probably would not be alive today. uh, In California, a thousand earthquakes have hit Southern California in a month, and hardly anyone noticed. Why? Because they were a swarm, a geddon, they called it. They weren't the kind that would destroy the world, but the scientists were said, wait a minute, those are precursors for something that is coming. And sure enough, you noticed how they did? They did have an earthquake out there. The United States Geological Survey reports that there were 12 to 15,000 earthquakes per year between the years 2000 and 2003. 
It reports that there were about 30 to 35,000 earthquakes per year between 2005 and 2008, and there were 40 to 50,000 earthquakes per year between 2009 and 2019. The words of Jesus are being fulfilled. Then we start thinking about weather-related events. Uh, Hurricane Katrina and Rita, $150 billion worth of damage. Say nothing of Dorian that just came through and wiped out so much of the Bahamas. These things are happening again and again and increasing. The damage that is done is one thing, and the loss of life that can't be replaced is even more devastating to us today. Families torn apart, communities destroyed. You can't put a price on that. Some places are experiencing terrible storms. Others are experiencing ongoing drought. Our world is in trouble. There's a reason why thousands, yes, millions of people marched on Friday of this year. Did anybody notice that? Why? because they are marching about the issue of climate change. Regardless of what you believe, the truth of the matter is the statistics show us things are getting worse in this world. Whatever the cause, Jesus said it would be like this before he comes back. He also said in Matthew 24, continuing on with his predictions, his prophecy, what does Jesus say? What does he have to say about prophecy? His own prediction said, in the end of time, it was going to be like the days of Noah were. It will be just before the Son of Man coming comes. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. While you and I are sitting here, people are out there plotting how to kill more people. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Genesis chapter 6 says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. We go back to Genesis because Jesus in Matthew 24 said the way it was in the days of Noah is the way it's going to be. So we go back. We just follow Jesus' lead. We go back to Genesis, and we find, sure enough, that's what it was like in those days. It's like that today. Sounds like the newspapers and the Internet news that we read today. What we see around us on our streets and our cities and around the world suggests that we're living in the day just like it was before Noah came. It's obvious that what Jesus said is coming to fulfillment. The first modern-day mass uh, shooting took place a few years ago. But we've become so used to it now, it's almost like daily news. We are almost immune to the whole process. It's because we're living in the days of the earth that are just like it was before Noah came. Many skeptics will say, well, these things have always been out there. Yes, but as Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 8, He said, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. I want you to notice what that means. It's very important to our understanding. The word sorrows in the Bible actually comes from the meaning of birth pains. Some Bibles even translate it that way. At first, not quite so intense, but they're further apart when the contractions begin and a child is about to be born. We know that the child is about to be born because the things get closer and closer to each other. Jesus used that as an illustration of helping us to understand the significance of these things. It's not just that we had an earthquake out here and we had this disease pop up somewhere, but it's the fact that things are getting closer and closer and more frequent that Jesus wants us to understand. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. It's the preponderance of these things, the frequency of these things. The signs are getting closer together. In Luke chapter 21, verse 28, Jesus said this, which Luke 21, by the way, is a companion chapter to Matthew 24. So Jesus is still talking about the same thing, signs of the end. He says, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. You and I can leave here tonight afraid or we can realize that it is a message of hope because Jesus wants us to know it's all about to come to an end. Look up, he says, because your redemption draws nigh. 
Jesus said to watch for these things so that we would be aware. Again in Matthew 24, 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. I'm not here to tell you the day that it's going to come. Jesus said we can't know that. But He did tell us that we can see the signs around us to know that it's about to, ha- ha- about to happen. What uplifting sign does Jesus give as another indicator of His soon return? Here is another one in Matthew 24, verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Many in the world are longing for something greater, something deeper that this world simply cannot satisfy. Perhaps you're one of those. There are so many religions out there, Muslims, atheists, Buddhists, others, realizing that the Bible only has the real answers to the problems of this world. Millions are discovering Christ and that in Him, in Jesus Christ, is our help and our hope. Did you know that Arabic is the third most requested language for studies in the Bible in the world? A lot of people think that Muslims have no interest and people live in that world have no interest, but it's the third most you, uh, asked for language for studying the Bible between English and Spanish. Jesus continues on by reminding us in His message we looked at in Revelation 14 earlier, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Do you see the parallel between what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, verse 14, 24, 14, and what He says in Revelation 14, verse 6? In one, He says, the gospel will go. And in the other, He says, when this happens, yeah, it's the message that the world needs to have. Quite literally, this message in Revelation is being fulfilled. Revelation 14, 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. My question for you tonight is, will you give Him the glory by your life? Will you be willing to give your life to Him and to worship Him as your Creator and your Redeemer? There is so much confusion in the world today, but Jesus has the answers. He wants you to not be confused. Along the way, He says, if you love Me, keep My commandments. All He wants us to do is be surrendered to Him and to follow the direction that He gives us in our lives. God can give you a new heart. He can change your life. He can give you hope, and He wants you to have that in your life. The one who made the water into wine, can take a sinner and make them a saint. God wants you to have help and hope in your life. He can open our eyes just as He opened the eyes of the blind. He can give us ears to hear the truth in the Word of God. He who raised the spiritually dead, the, the physical dead, can raise the spiritually dead back to spiritual life. We come to God with inspired messages from the book of Revelation. It is a spiritual exercise because the experience of the book of Revelation is one that comes through a spiritual experience. You see, friends, as we read the Bible, when we look at the prophecies in Revelation and the signs of the times, we recognize that the last movements of this earth are right upon us soon to be fulfilled. There is a message you and I want to have in our lives. That message is He wants you and me to have faith in God. What does it mean to know about the signs of the coming of Jesus? What about the prophecies that you've heard so much about in the mark of the beast? Who is the beast? the image to the beast that's spoken of in Revelation. How can we know about all those things? Those things are not important to us until we have something clear in our minds, and that is God wants us first to have faith in Jesus. 
That's why the book of Revelation starts out by saying it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's another prophet who made this statement. He said, we cannot be far away from what Daniel called a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. As a matter of fact, we'll look at a prophecy on Tuesday night, tomorrow night, that will help us really to understand exactly how crystal clear the Bible is about predicting the future of the world thousands of years in advance. The signs that you and I have looked at today tell us that Jesus is coming back again very soon. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at a prophecy that will help us to understand how could God know what He knew ahead of time, because He is God. So, my friends, thank you for coming here this evening. I want you to know that there's a message of hope for you. If you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, you've never made that decision, there's a card in your packet. You can fill that out and just turn that in if you would like to or keep it in your, in your uh, packet for your own uh, remembrance of a decision that you made for Jesus. If you'd like to give your heart to Him, you know that God wants you to have that opportunity. I'd like to conclude with prayer and then remind you of what's coming tomorrow night. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I want to thank you that Jesus has indeed told us of his tremendous love for us. That's the good news that the Bible gives us. Lord, I want to ask you that you will continue to help us to understand that what Jesus knew about the future and the signs that he predicted are indeed the ones that are going on around us right now. I pray that you will help us to realize that you tell us all these things because you want us to be ready when Jesus comes again. And I pray that as we leave this place, we will go with courage in our hearts, knowing that we have nothing to fear except as we do not make that decision to follow Jesus. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, same place. We will be talking about prophecy's final world superpower spoken of in one of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible. Look forward to seeing you there. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Don't forget to get a brochure as you're leaving, and we'll also be giving you a lesson from, uh, uh, from, that goes with what we've talked about today, so you have some printed notes along with that, okay? So I hope you will get a hold of that, All right? Did I have a question or something you wanted me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you all. Have a great night, and I'm going to come, actually, I'm going to come out to the door and say uh, hello to everybody. <laughs>